Hey Future Unnaturalists, I'm Emily. And I'm Andy. And we are the hosts of Unnatural, a true crime podcast. Each week, we'll dive into some of the most unnerving crimes that this unnatural world has to offer. Listen for Unnatural on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And remember, make good choices. And don't get got. Bye. I'm Dee Dee West, and this is Broken Limelight. You guys, Ronnie Spector just died. Just yesterday, man, and I've been working on this episode for days now. I can't believe this just happened. If you're not familiar with Ronnie Spector, she was the lead singer of the Ronettes. They were a 60s girl band. One of their most famous songs is Be My Baby, which was actually produced by Phil Spector, who would marry Ronnie Spector. I gotta tell you, it's just fucking weird how this worked out, because... I originally was going to cover Phil Hartman today, and then Morbid Podcast released an episode on Phil Hartman like two days ago, so I was like, well, if anybody's listening to both of us, I should switch to a different subject. So I switched to Phil Spector, and and then Ronnie died, and that's so sad. But this is a really good opportunity for me to tell you a little bit about Ronnie's life and career, because as you can imagine... She is very pertinent to the Phil Spector story. This episode is about Phil Spector and the death of Lana Clarkson. Phil Spector has a lot of achievements and really interesting life. Like, he's had a lot of relationships with really interesting people. And I could tell you all about it, but it would be like two full episodes just talking about Phil's life and achievements, which I don't feel like doing. And also, fuck him. I'd rather use this time to talk about the crime and shine a little bit of light on who Lana Clarkson was, and also talk about his relationships like with Ronnie Spector, for example. But don't worry, there's a lot of juicy stuff about Phil that I can't leave out, and his history of relationships is seemingly pretty relevant to this case, so this episode is still pretty Phil-heavy. If you're interested in learning more about Phil after this episode, I will list some great books about him on the episode page on BrokenLimelight.com. I'll upload a link to the show notes here on the, the episode description. Apart from the books, I also listened to two podcasts who did a really good job at covering this case. One was Red Handed. It had a lot of good information about the crime itself and the trials. The other is Hollywood Crime Scene. They're one of my favorites. They did a really in-depth podcast episode on the case, and they really dove into the relationship with Ronnie Bennett or Ronnie Spector, Ronnie from the Ronettes. Phil Spector was born in the Bronx on December 26, 1939. His parents were Jewish immigrants. Sadly, Phil lost his father at just eight years old to suicide. Phil was always a small, scrawny, awkward kid, and from a young age, he found comfort in music. He was given a guitar at his bar mitzvah, and when he was in high school, he formed the band The Teddy Bears, who released the song called to know him is to love him, which was a quote that was inscribed on his father's gravestone. The song reached number one on the Billboard Top 100 in 1958 when Phil was just 18 years old. The teddy bears would break up and Phil started a project called The Spectres 3. It was said that Phil had stage fright, so he never really performed again, and then he started a production company with Lester Sill in 1961, and they called it Philly's Records, combining their names. This made Phil Spector the youngest label owner in the United States at just 21 years old. And he was very successful. Like, dude was pretty much a millionaire by his early 20s. Phil was the producer behind hit songs by The Crystals, The Righteous Brothers, a couple Beatles songs, and most notably, The Ronettes. Phil was famous for his technique called The Wall of Sound. This was like a musical formula that Phil used to produce a big, big kind of orchestral sound. There was more to it than just playing loudly. He would like use multiple instruments way more than usual, like combining acoustic with electric instruments, and he would layer them over each other and mix them perfectly to make one big sound. Hence the name Wall of Sound. 
He also used session musicians like the Wrecking Crew, and they actually helped him develop the Wall of Sound technique and went on to become his house band. Phil was really inspired by Wagner, and he called it a kind of Wagner approach to rock and roll, like little symphonies for the kids. In 1963, Phil married Annette Mehrer, who was the lead vocalist of The Spectres 3. To be honest, there's not very much information out there about Annette. Phil had a production company at one point, and he named it Annette Records after her. But even back then, pretty much everyone was like, nobody really knows anything about her. In March 1963, Phil signed the Ronettes. The Ronettes were made up of Ronnie or Veronica Bennett, her sister Estelle, and their cousin Nidra Talley. They released the hit Be My Baby in August 1963. Not long after the Ronettes were signed with Philly's records, Phil started having an affair with Ronnie. Ronnie didn't know that Phil was married at this time. She was actually, like, a really good girl, and they were really just talking and flirting for a while. They weren't even having sex. But Ronnie was wrapped up in romance with Phil. Phil was really possessive and controlling of Ronnie. In January 1964, the Ronettes went to the UK for their first British tour. According to Nidra Talley, that's Ronnie's cousin who was in the Ronettes, as soon as they set foot on British soil, Phil did a weird thing with his voice. He, like, changed his voice and started speaking in a higher pitch that was clearly not natural. It was really weird. Like, he's in Britain, so now he needs a new voice. The Rolling Stones would open for the Ronettes, and Phil forbade the Stones from fraternizing with them. On their first night in the UK, Ronnie met John Lennon, and they instantly hit it off. At some point, they kissed and, like, tumbled onto a bed together, and she stopped him and said, I can't. I've got a guy waiting back home. A month later, in February 1964, the Beatles would come to America for the first time. This was peak British invasion, Beatlemania, and the Beatles actually invited the Ronettes to fly back to America with them. Which was awesome, because, I mean, they needed to come back anyway, and, like, it would have been huge for their career, you know, to be seen coming out of, coming off of the plane with the Beatles. But Phil would not allow it. On February 7th, 1964, the Beatles arrived at the John F. Kennedy Airport in New York. This was a huge event. It was all over the news and all over the radio. So Ronnie was watching their arrival on TV, and as they're stepping off the plane, you can see Phil Spector stepping off with them. So he actually flew to the UK so he could fly back with the Beatles after telling the Ronettes that they couldn't do it. Which, like, I don't understand because if he really was just, like, worried something would happen, like, why couldn't he just oversee them? But anyway, Ronnie was really, really hurt and angry and disappointed. In June of 1964, Ronnie lost her virginity to Phil. Phil's hair started to fall out around this time. He was about 24, so he started wearing toupees. Ronnie would often tease him about how silly the toupees looked. Phil became more and more possessive. One day, Sonny Bono took the Ronettes out to lunch, and when they got back to the studio, Phil had destroyed everything in a temper tantrum. Phil never seemed to have any actual friends. He, of course, worked with a lot of people, and he had a ton of work relationships and associates, but he didn't have any real friends or confidants. He also had a real problem with his temper, if you haven't gathered that already. A lot of people think that it has to do with his small stature, like a Napoleon complex. Phil was scrawny as hell, and he was only five foot five, and he was super defensive about it. Whenever people would tease him about his height, he would be like, okay, meet me outside. And then he would go outside, and he would wait with his gun in hand and with two gigantic bodyguards behind him. One day, Phil was at the studio, and his mom came by to bring him soup. I think maybe he was under the weather or something, and his mom is like this sweet little Jewish lady, and she came by and brought her, or brought him, her homemade soup. Phil actually locked her out of the building and told everybody not to let her in, like, shh, tell her I'm not here. And the whole time that she's knocking, he was bitching, like, I'm a grown-ass man, I I'm a millionaire, I don't need my, my mom bringing me soup. Ronnie was in the studio hanging out with Darlene Love, and Ronnie was like, isn't he, isn't he so cute? Isn't he just the sweetest? 
And Darlene was like, I guess. And Ronnie was like, look, I'm going to marry this man. And Darlene was like, girl, he is married. Ronnie was like, are you fucking kidding me? She had no idea. So she started asking, well, who the fuck is this woman? And Darlene was like, look, I don't know. Her name is Annette and she lives in his penthouse, but nobody knows anything about her. Ronnie kind of starts to put two and two together and starts remembering things like seeing a woman's shoes at his house that he claimed were his cousins. Things like that. Like it starts to make sense. It's it starts to add up now. Ronnie was pissed, but she was afraid of losing her career. So she decided not to confront Phil and just tough it out. She pretended like it just wasn't happening to the point that she eventually kind of forgot. In 1965, the Ronettes were voted the third top singing group in England behind the Beatles and the Rolling Stones. But before long, the Ronettes star was starting to fade. And we can kind of thank Phil for that. It seems that Phil didn't want Ronnie to get too big. He didn't want her to move up and start working with other producers. He didn't want her to have any more power. Like, where she was now, he was still in control. So he didn't want her to grow. By the way, a lot of this stuff that I'm saying about Ronnie is actually from her book. It's called Be My Baby, How I Survived Mascara, Miniskirts, and Madness, or My Life as a Fabulous Ronette. The Ronettes were invited to perform on Dick Clark's Caravan of Stars, but Phil wouldn't allow her to go. He always kind of manipulated her by saying things like, no, you need to be working hard in the studio. Like, that's where you need to be right now. So the Ronettes ended up going without her and her cousin Elaine ended up filling in for her. The song Chapel of Love, which ended up being recorded by the Dixie Cups, was originally intended for the Ronettes. The Ronettes recorded it and Phil found some imaginary problem with it and then ended up passing it off to the Dixie Cups. Phil would often do that. He would be like, don't you hear that? What is that? Do you hear that? And everybody would be like, I don't hear anything. But he was, you know, he was the boss. The Ronettes were asked to tour with the Beatles in 1966. But again, Phil guilted Ronnie not to go, telling her that she needed to go back into the studio. So again, she was replaced by Elaine. John was really bummed out. He truly thought that her voice was incredible and she was the shit. In fact, the whole band was bummed. I don't know if I said this, but her sister Estelle actually dated George Harrison. So it seemed like the two bands were pretty friendly with each other. And of course, Ronnie was bummed. I mean, can you imagine being invited by the Beatles to tour with them in 1966 at the peak of their career? And Ronnie had to sit it out. One night, Ronnie and Phil were having dinner with Ronnie's mom. And her mom talked about the tour and mentioned how John Lennon just went on and on about how wonderful Ronnie was and how terrific her voice was and how he wished she was there. Phil did not like that. He had steam coming out of his ears. He grabbed his napkin and threw it down and was like, God damn it. He just didn't like that she was getting attention from another man, much less somebody important like John Lennon. Phil and Ronnie would end up getting a mansion together in Beverly Hills. Phil quietly divorced the net around this time. Phil started working with Ike and Tina Turner, and he produced the song River Deep Mountain High. This was in 1966. Apparently, this song was a flop originally. And this devastated Phil because he thought the song was a masterpiece, which, you know, we know that the song became a huge hit in the 70s. But before that, he expected a lot more recognition for that song. After this, Phil didn't come out much or do any interviews for a while. Ronnie became really lonely and bored because without Phil, she's not exactly able to produce music. Ronnie ended up turning to alcohol and developing alcoholism at about age 25. Up until this point, she didn't really drink. She was around it a lot because, I mean, she was a musician and a lot of people in the industry would get drunk often, but she wasn't really one to drink up until this point. So now at age 25, Ronnie's living with Phil, who's always drunk, and he wouldn't let her do anything. Like, she would try to clean the house or make herself something to eat, and he would yell at her and say, Why are you doing that? We have maids for that. If Ronnie wanted to go to the store, Phil made her take this inflatable doll that looked like him in the passenger seat. What a weird way to control her. 
Phil noticed that Ronnie was getting drunk all the time, so he put a padlock on the bar so she couldn't get into it. So now she had to go to the store more often to go get more alcohol, and each time she had to take the Phil doll with her. Phil was really emotionally and psychologically abusive. He kept a glass coffin in the house, and he would say things like, This is the coffin you're going to be buried in. And if you leave me, you'll be in that coffin where I can watch after you even after you're dead. He started calling Ronnie by her full first name, Veronica, which nobody called her. To me, that's a lot like when you're talking to a child and you use their middle name. Or maybe he was trying to remake her identity and separate her from Ronnie the Star. Like, you're not Ronnie from the Ronettes, you're Veronica Spector, my wife. Ronnie always wanted to have a family, but she wasn't able to get pregnant. They would end up adopting three children together. The kids would later claim that Phil was abusive towards them and would trap them in a room with locks on the door. In 1972, Ronnie became sober and started going to meetings. She got a sponsor and was active in the program, and she was doing really well and finally starting to see a light at the end of the tunnel. One night, Ronnie went out to her AA meeting and came home late, and Phil was pissed so he decided to lock her out of the house. Ronnie's mom had actually been staying with them, so Ronnie got her attention and she let her in. Ronnie snuck inside the house, kicked off her shoes, and then Phil came downstairs and was like, what the fuck, and just started freaking out on them, and a screaming match ensued between Phil and Ronnie and Ronnie's mom, and Phil was yelling all kinds of things like, fuck you, what the fuck do you think you're doing, to making death threats. Ronnie's mom yelled to him, I'll grab that wig off your skinny little head. (laughs) I don't know if I said this already, but Phil Spector liked to wear wigs. Not not just toupees. This evolved into full-ass wigs. And that's a whole thing, so I'll get to that in a minute. Phil was screaming, telling Ronnie that if she tried to leave him, he would kill her and he knows how to do it and get away with it. He actually grabbed Ronnie's shoes and hid them which was a thing that he regularly did during arguments to keep her from leaving. But Ronnie was like, fuck this, and she left. Fortunately, Ronnie was able to get out of that situation and divorce him in 1974. She ended up getting remarried in 1982. So back to Phil. In the 70s, Phil got back into the studio. Phil was notorious for always having a gun on him, and also for getting wasted on Manischewitz during his recording sessions. He was often seen waving his gun in the air, all drunk and angry. There was even one occasion in 1973 where he was in the recording studio with the full band and they were recording with John Lennon and Phil became upset about something and he came into the room with his gun in the air and started spouting off and berating the band and he shot into the ceiling. He once pulled a gun on Leonard Cohen. He was drunk as fuck. He had a bottle of Manischewitz in one hand and the gun in the other and he held the gun to Leonard's throat and said, Leonard, I love you. To which Leonard replied, I hope you do. Allegedly, Phil also pulled a gun on the Ramones one time in 1979. So he's got a track record for this kind of thing now. In 1974, Phil was involved in a horrific car accident and ended up getting 700 stitches in his head and face. So Phil pretty much said goodbye to what was left of his hair, and this is where his love of wigs really got started. Phil was notorious for his wigs. And like I said, these weren't just toupees. These were full-on wigs, and they were not subtle. They did not pass off as natural, because he would change his wigs, like, constantly. Like, one day you would see him with a short brown shag haircut, and the next day you'd see him with a giant gray afro, and then you'd see him with, like, a blonde bob cut. I mean, Phil Spector changed his wigs more than most women do. He had a new-ass look every day, like a whole new vibe every day. And, like, I'm telling you, you can look through pictures and videos of the trial, and he's got so many looks throughout it. I'll post a collage of all his wig looks on BrokenLimelight.com. So Phil again becomes reclusive and spends all his time in his mansion in Alhambra, which he called a castle. I'd like to know what makes um, a residence a castle, or if you can just start calling it that and that makes it a castle. What are the requirements? Or what about a palace? Can I tell people, 
Come on over to my palace. Does that qualify? Anyway, Phil liked to call his home a castle. Now, on February 3rd, 2003, Phil left his castle in Alhambra at about 7 p.m. He went on a date to a restaurant called The Grill on the Alley, but apparently this was just his first date for the evening because after dinner, Phil's chauffeur would drive his date home and then drive Phil back to The Grill on the Alley for a second date with one of the servers of the restaurant. It's not clear if he had just met the server that night while on his first date or if he already knew her. But either way, it's pretty shitty. The driver took Phil and his second date to a bar called Trader Vic's, and after that, they went to another bar called Downtowners, which was one of Phil's favorites. By the way, Phil's been drinking straight rum since like 7.30 p.m., so by midnight, he was shit face. After the date, Phil wasn't ready to go home yet, so he went to the House of Blues in Los Angeles. Lana Clarkson was working at the House of Blues as a server. When Phil tried to walk inside, Lana stopped him and said, Ma'am, ma'am, I'm sorry, you can't go in there. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Lana was obviously embarrassed. A co-worker explained to her that this was Phil Spector, who was a legendary music producer. In her defense, Phil was a scrawny little five foot five little old man. And he was probably wearing his fucking Carol Burnett looking wig. So she thought that he was this little old lady. And Phil, Phil was like, I'm not a ma'am. Somebody tell this bitch who I am. I'm Phil fucking Spectre. So Lana went above and beyond to make up for it and take really good care of Phil as a patron of the business. And she was truly starstruck when she found out who he was. Let me tell you a little bit about Lana. Lana Clarkson was a B-movie actress, so her name might not be familiar to everyone, but she did have a really consistent career and quite a cult following. She was probably best known for starring in the movie Barbarian Queen, and she had bit parts in a lot of well-known shows and movies. She made her screen debut as a minor character in Fast Times at Ridgemont High, where she played the wife of the science teacher, Mr. Vargas. That was actually her first speaking role. She also appeared in Scarface. You can see her dancing on the dance floor behind Michelle Pfeiffer. So even though she wasn't exactly a household name, she wasn't struggling to find work. Around Christmas 2001, Lana was involved in an accident where she broke both of her wrists. She had to undergo numerous surgeries on each of her hands. This is what really limited Lana's ability to take on work. Lana's roles tended to be really physical and stunt-heavy. She often played, like, some kind of horse-riding warrior princess kind of thing, so this was a pretty big blow to her career, and it kept her away from acting for over a year. So Lana reached out to her friends and relatives, kind of asking for their opinion on whether she should just retire from acting altogether. And this is how she landed her job at the House of Blues. According to Lana's PR manager, Lana's wrists didn't keep her out of the game altogether. The two of them were actually working on a publicity plan for a stand-up show that she was planning to do. This is all important because when Lana died, nobody was there except for her and Phil, and later it would be claimed that Lana was depressed about her career and suicidal. So when Phil went to the House of Blues and Lana found out who he was, she tried really hard to be friendly and just be a really great server to him. The House of Blues would close at 2 a.m., so around 1.45, Phil asked Lana to come back to his castle for a drink. Initially, she declined, but she was seen getting into his car at about 2.30 a.m. on the parking lot surveillance footage. They got back to Phil's castle at around 3 a.m. The driver, who had been chauffeuring them that night, was named Adriano D'Souza, and Phil told him to wait at the end of the driveway while he and Lana went inside. What happened inside of Phil's home during the next two hours can't be known for sure. Between 4 and 5 a.m., the driver, Adriano, heard a loud noise, followed by Phil stumbling outside with a gun in one hand, saying, I think I killed somebody. Before calling the police, Adriano actually called up Phil's manager, Michelle Blaine. She didn't answer, so he left a message saying something like, Mr. Spectre, I think he killed somebody. I need you to call me back right away. I'm calling the police right now. And then he called the police. 911, 
what are you reporting? Hi, it's, uh, my name is Adriano. I, I think my boss killed somebody. And why do you believe he may have killed somebody? Because he have a lady on the, on the floor and he has a gun on the, in his hand. Police arrived at Phil's castle at about 5.10 a.m. They could see Phil kind of walking around upstairs, and then he came out through the back door. He was stumbling, absolutely wasted, and they asked him to take his hands out of his pockets. Phil became belligerent and flat-out refused. The police at this point don't know who the shooter is. All they know is that there's a suspected homicide and the suspect is still armed. And Phil was absolutely not cooperating, so they arrested him. Throughout the whole time that the police were there, Phil never tried to tell the police that there was a woman in his home who had been shot. Not only that, but he had about 15 phones in this gigantic house, and he didn't pick up any one of them to try and call the police. The police found Lana's body slumped over in a chair. She had been shot in the mouth. The bullet severed her spine and exited through the base of her skull, killing her almost instantly. The recoil of the gun had knocked out some of her teeth. Lana was fully dressed, she had her shoes and her jacket on, and she also had her purse slung over her shoulder. The gun was sitting at her feet. So this crime scene, guys, is a bloody fucking mess. There's literally blood and teeth like on the floor and all the walls. Phil was arrested and locked up, and the police interviewed him, and he's like, totally shit-faced, just absolutely drunk, and he claims that Lana shot herself. He was recorded spouting off, saying, She's a piece of shit. I don't know what her fucking problem is, but she certainly had no right to come into my fucking castle and blow her fucking head open. Whether or not she killed herself, what the fuck kind of attitude is that? But also, like, what? Like, Phil claimed he went upstairs for a minute, and when he came down, she shot herself. But the gun was, like, gently rested on her left foot, and she was right-handed, by the way. And if you look at pictures, it certainly doesn't look like she just shot herself and dropped it there, judging from the photos. That's just my opinion, of course. Throughout this whole thing, Phil never mentioned her name. I don't think he actually knew what it was. Phil made his $1 million bail, and he and his assistant, Michelle, checked into the five-star Bel Air Hotel for about a week while police investigated his castle. Must be nice. Police found a drawer open in Phil's house, which there were like 33 to 35 rooms in his house, and only one drawer was open. And inside of it, there was a holster that fit the gun that was used to shoot Lana. Lana's blood was found on the banister, on a doorknob, and on a blood-soaked cloth in one of the bathrooms. Some sources said that this cloth was a diaper, which I don't even want to think about why Phil Spector in his 60s has diapers in his home. Prosecutors said that all this blood all over the place was evidence that Phil tried to clean up the murder, while the defense argued that this was actually proof that Phil was trying to help Lana. Police ended up finding nine other firearms in his house and a white jacket, it was a woman's jacket, that Phil was wearing to the House of Blues that night, and it was found to have had up to 18 tiny droplets of Lana's blood on it. Again, the prosecutor said that this was proof that Phil shot her, while the defense argued that there would have been a lot more blood if he really were close enough to shoot her. I mean, maybe he wasn't even wearing the jacket. Like, for all we know, maybe the jacket was on a coat rack nearby. And maybe he changed out of whatever he really was wearing. Maybe he was actually wearing nothing but the diaper. Huh. <laughs> Just kidding, I don't think that actually happened. While Phil was at the Bel Air Hotel with his assistant Michelle, she tried to get more information from him about what actually happened. Now, a lot of people don't trust Michelle because she really stuck by his side throughout this whole thing and then kind of distanced, distanced herself from Phil after he was convicted. But Michelle says that, when she asked Phil about what happened, he would just say it was an accident, but he never clarified how it was an accident or provided any real explanation. Michelle said that it felt like she was taking care of a child who was in really big trouble. Once Phil was allowed to go back to his home in Alhambra, he took every opportunity to bash Lana Clarkson and tell anyone who would listen that she killed herself and even kissed the gun before doing so. Like, why? Why the embellishment? 
Seven months after Lana's death, L.A. Sheriff's Department officially ruled it a homicide on September 22, 2003. Phil was charged with murder, and the trial began on March 19, 2007. Phil made Michelle film him, explaining how he couldn't have possibly killed Lana Clarkson, and she killed herself, and he didn't know why, and he didn't care. By the way, in this interview, it's like in 2005, I think, and he's wearing like a Hawaiian shirt and a puka shell necklace and an enormous wig, looking like he's on vacation or something, and he just sounds completely delusional. According to Michelle, Phil reached out to a lot of people for support while awaiting the trial, and nobody answered or got back to him. Which is easy to believe, considering he didn't really have any friends, and like, why would anybody take this opportunity to step up and be a part of this whole mess? Michelle also claimed that Phil asked her to marry him because she might have known too much, and that way she couldn't be forced to testify against him. She declined his proposal. Phil's trial began. Throughout the trial, he went through four different lawyers and about five different wigs. Probably. He really did change his wig every damn day during this trial. One of his lawyers was Robert Shapiro, who was on O.J. Simpson's legal team. And that case wasn't actually all that different from this one. I'm going to cover that one soon. Don't worry. The prosecution was led by Deputy District Attorney Alan Jackson, who said that famous people have a key to the back door of the justice system in Hollywood, and they were not going to let it happen this time. Jackson and his team had a very clear argument. They argued that Lana went to Phil's house, and she rejected his advances. She tried to leave, he got mad, and he shot her. All the evidence pointed to this. I mean, there was the witness, Adriano, who saw Phil with the gun in his hand and heard him say, I think I killed somebody. There was the gun laying by Lana's left foot, even though she was right-handed. There was the jacket that he was wearing that night that had the blood spots on it. That was found upstairs in a wardrobe, so he had to have taken it off and put it away between the time that Lana was shot and the police arrived. Also, the prosecution brought in a doctor who testified that Lana's tongue was bruised, indicating that the gun was forced into her mouth. And the blood drops on his jacket were proof that he had to be standing no more than three feet away from Lana, and his arms must have been stretched out towards her. And to make things worse for Phil, the prosecution brought in five women who all testified under oath that they each had incidents with Phil Spector where he had been drinking, and when they tried to leave, he threatened them with a gun. With all of this evidence against Phil, the defense had a pretty difficult job and they decided to point the finger at the victim. They destroyed Lana's character and painted her as a depressed, washed-up has-been with no hopes for her future. They also said that, regardless of what the doctor said, blood spatter could actually reach out over six feet. Then they argued that Phil wasn't even in the room when Lana shot herself, but he heard the gunshot and then ran in to aid her, And then Lana exhaled and blood came out of her mouth and splattered onto his jacket. They insisted that Phil would have been covered in blood if he had truly shot her. But as you can probably imagine, most of the blood actually ended up behind Lana. Because he's standing in front of her shooting her and she's got an exit wound on the back of her skull. And like, if she wanted to kill herself, why would she do it at Phil's house? Like, why would she... Go to work and then go home with the guy she just met and then kill herself at his house with his gun. Like, she just met this guy. She's never been to his house. And his house had, like, 35 bedrooms. So could she really have rummaged through all the rooms in his house looking for a gun without him noticing? And furthermore, this is just weird to me. Why would she put on her handbag over her shoulder before killing herself? Like, I just picture this scene in Phil's brain that's all old Hollywood style, and she's sitting in his fancy-ass chair, and she puts on her coat and her purse, and she holds the gun up to herself and says, Goodbye, cruel world. I'm on to the next world, and I'm taking my handbag with me. The defense also tried to discredit the testimony of Adriano D'Souza, the chauffeur, who was the only witness. They tried to say that English wasn't his first language, so it's possible that he misunderstood. Which, like, first of all, racist much? Like, oh, that's easy for you to pull. This guy's foreign, so he's no longer credible. But, like, you guys heard that 911 call? 
His English is not bad, and he sounds pretty confident about what he's saying. But here's a clip of it again, just for kicks. Hi, it's, uh, my name is Adriano. I, I think my boss killed somebody. Because he have a lady on the, on the floor, and he has a gun on it in his hand. So the defense is just trying absolutely everything to get the jury to believe them. And here's the thing. The defense doesn't have the burden of the proof. All they have to do is ensure reasonable doubt. The case is pretty much relying on whether the jury believes that Lana put the gun in her mouth and shot herself. On December 26, 2007, the judge declared a mistrial as the jury was hung, 10 pointing to guilty and 2 to not guilty. Alan Jackson, the deputy department district attorney, he was not about to let him off the hook. So he looked into those two jurors and it turned out that one of them he didn't really understand what reasonable doubt meant. See, he believed that because there was no video evidence of Phil killing Lana, Lana could have killed herself. But, like, that's not really how it works. But anyway, it was considered a mistrial because of that. Now, it's rumored that in the second trial, there were FBI agents in the courtroom because they believed that the jury had been tampered with in the first trial. There is one thing that I don't really find credible, but I'm going to mention it so people don't think that I, I didn't know this or didn't hear this. But some people, including Nancy Grace and another reporter, speculated that Phil Spector and Lana Clarkson actually did have sex. The theory was that they slept together and Lana was disgusted with herself and decided to kill herself. But autopsies showed no notations of semen present and no signs of sexual intercourse. Nancy Gray said, we know that her DNA was on his genitals and vice versa, but she never says how she knows or, like, where she got that from. Other claims said that Phil spoke to a nurse or a coroner or something who swiped Lana's genitals, removing all the semen before her exam. Now, my thing is that if any of this was credible, the defense would have led with that. So I'm thinking that never happened. The second trial began on October 29, 2008. Phil was represented by Doran Weinberg, who openly admitted, everyone knows that Phil Spector waves a gun around, but he never shot anyone. He also told Phil to pick one wig for the trial and stick with it. <laughs> this guy is so comical to me. Like, he's in his 60s, and the whole trial, he's got a glazed look on his face, and his lawyers whispering in his ear, coaching him every second and reminding him how to behave. And to actually have to sit him down like a six-year-old and say, Listen, Phil, I know you like the wigs, but I really need you to pick one. On April 13, 2009, the second jury found Phil Spector guilty of murder in the second degree and sentenced him to 19 years to life in prison. It was considered second degree because it wasn't premeditated. I would even be willing to accept that this might have been an accident. I mean... Judging from his history with other women, maybe he did stick the gun in her mouth, meaning only to threaten her and then accidentally shot her. And he was also wasted. So, I mean, maybe he, maybe he even doesn't really clearly remember how it happened. But either way, he stuck the gun in her mouth and tried to cover it up afterwards. Phil got married again in 2006 to a woman named Rochelle Short. Let me remind you. Lana died in late 2003, and the trial began in early 2007. So, this lady married Phil right in the midst of everything before the trial started. She was 26 when she married Phil, and she even looks like Lana Clarkson. Rochelle professed Phil's innocence in numerous interviews, saying things like, How could he be guilty when he had so little blood on him? Thank God he was wearing white. <sighs> Okay, Rochelle. Rochelle was also really stressed out because all the trials were putting them in a lot of debt. And I'll bet she was stressed out about that. They ended up filing for divorce in 2016 after 10 years. Michelle Blaine has since distanced herself from Phil Spector, apparently fearing for her own safety and that of her children. According to her, when she quit, Phil threw a tantrum and shouted, You're fucking fired. I should have killed you. Again, I don't, I don't know if I believe Michelle. Decades after his divorce to Ronnie, Phil still felt as though he had some sort of control over her. 
He led a campaign in 2007 to bar her from being inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Their son, Dante Phillip, claimed in an interview that all three kids were abused by Phil and they described their relationship with him as a thin line between love and hate. Phil Spector died in prison in January 2021. He had a lot of health issues, but he had also been diagnosed with the coronavirus, which his family believes was the ultimate reason for his death. Ronnie spoke out about his death, saying, It's a sad day for music and a sad day for me. When I was working with Phil Spector, watching him create in the recording studio, I knew I was working with the very best. He was in complete control, directing everyone. So much to love about those days. Meeting him and falling in love was like a fairy tale. The magical music we were able to make together was inspired by our love. I loved him madly and gave my heart and soul to him. She also added that, although her ex-husband was a brilliant producer, he was a lousy husband. Which is like, understatement of the century. Ronnie also said, Unfortunately, Phil was not able to live and function outside of the recording studio. Darkness set in, many lives were damaged. I still smile when I hear the music we made together, and always will. The music will be forever. Ronnie Spector continued recording music well into her 70s. Sadly, she died yesterday, January 12, 2022, at 78 years old. Her family said that she was filled with love and gratitude. Her joyful sound, playful nature, and magical presence will live on in all who knew, heard, or saw her. In lieu of flowers, Ronnie requested that donations be made to your local women's shelter or to the American Indian College Fund. The family respectfully asks for privacy at this time. And that's pretty much the story. There is a movie about this case where Al Pacino plays Phil Spector. Like I said, I will list all my sources on BrokenLimelight.com. That's where I upload information for each episode I do. I will link it in the show notes below, so wherever you're listening to this, if you just click on where it says details or something along those lines, you should be able to find the link there. All right, guys, that's it for today. Thank you again for listening. Don't forget, you can go to BrokenLimelight.com to read this episode's show notes, an almost complete transcript. I have sources and pictures and videos and interviews, oh my, all over on the website. If you have a strong opinion or a question about this case, you can leave a comment on the episode website. If you'd like to hear a particular case, you can always reach out to me at ddwest at brokenlimelight.com. Thanks again for listening. You guys are my favorite. Bye-bye. Today's episode is brought to you by Hunt a Killer. Hunt a Killer is a monthly mystery subscription box that's truly one of a kind. It's basically like a true crime case in a box. It comes with case files, codes to decipher, detailed backgrounds about the suspects and the victims. There's evidence for you to evaluate. It tells an immersive story of a whole crime case from beginning to end. It's kind of like an escape room in a box. You can do this by yourself, or you can team up with a buddy, or you can do it for like a game night or even a date night. You can take a little break from technology and immerse yourself fully into this box. Or if you prefer to be a more high-tech investigator, you can join online communities and talk to other Hunt a Killer players about clues and stuff. Hunt a Killer also shares part of the proceeds to the Cold Case Foundation, so your purchase actually helps with real-life cold cases. The best news is that Broken Limelight listeners get 20% off of their first subscription box. So go get started now at huntakiller.com And don't forget to use the code BROKENLIMELIGHT to get your 20% off. That's BROKENLIMELIGHT, all one word.